what I'm going to say in the next uh, 10 minutes will hopefully complement what, what you've said in the, uh, in the video. Um, so, I mean, what you set out in the video in terms of is, is what Britain did in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings in, in, in that year, 2011 and subsequent years. So what I want to talk about in these 10 minutes is why Britain behaved in this way. Um, what's Britain doing in the Middle East? What, what are its interests? And what's the sort of explanations, the deeper explanations for its, for for its behaviour outlined in the video? <clears throat> so, I mean, there are two reasons for Britain's, two reasons why Britain behaved in this way during the Arab uprising. So the, the first is the strategic value of Middle Eastern oil. And the second is the opportunities offered by the wealth that's generated by the sale of that oil. So strategic value of Middle Eastern oil and the wealth generated by its sale. Those are the two key things um, shaping British policy. Let's talk about the strategic value of Middle East oil, first of all. Oil is the lifeblood of the industrial, industrialised world economy. That oil is an absolutely key strategic resource. It's not just about transport and energy, energy generation. It's about all the kind of secondary uses for oil. Oil is used in pesticides, petrochemicals, fertilizers, it's using all kinds of synthetic, synthetic fibers, uh, plastics. Oil, oil is everywhere. So really, as, as I say, it's, it, it's the lifeblood of the industrialized world economy. It's a fundamental commodity. And around half of the world's oil, oil reserves, are in the Middle East. Most of them are in the Gulf. So that's a huge strategic prize for any state that's interested in global power. And there's, there's no commodity like it. If you control the oil, then you have structural power in the world system. And the big powers have known this throughout. You, you go back to any of the declassified records and you see state planners talking about exactly this. British civil servants saying in no uncertain terms, we must have control of this oil. So in the early and middle 20th century, British imperial power worked to dominate the Middle East for that very reason, because of the, the importance of oil. Other reasons too, but oil was the key one. And then as Britain, uh, British power declined after World War II, London worked to support American hegemony in the Middle East. If you can't be the world's number one power yourself, you tag along the coattails of the power that you would most like to see dominate the world, which for Britain, from Britain's point of view was the US. So in the, in, in the last 70 years, Britain's role in the Middle East has been to support US hegemony in the Middle East and the client regimes in, in the Middle East, its client regimes, America's client regimes, so that Middle Eastern oil was under the strategic control of the West with the US in the lead. And that's important in terms of great power competition. You know, in World War II, it was really important that Middle Eastern oil was denied to the Nazis. In the Cold War, it was really important that those strategic reserves, um, that, that, that communist Russia was, that the Soviet Union was excluded from those strategic reserves. Now, because China is a growing and energy hungry and energy poor country, the US has used strategic power over China because it's sitting on those oil reserves in the Middle East. So the strategic factor has continued throughout these decades. That's number one. Second reason Britain behaves the way it does in the region is the value of the oil. You know, it's not just the strategic value of the oil, it's the economic value of the oil, the, the riches that are generated by the sale of that oil. And the oil riches of the Gulf region are of great value to the British state and to British capitalism. And this is all in, in my book. Um, well, all of, all of this is in my book, but especially this stuff, the fact that Gulf financial flows into the city of London are highly significant. The fact that the Gulf is a valuable export market. We talk a lot about arms sales. Actually, the, the profits generated by arms sales aren't that significant to British capitalism. Um, you know, it's, not, it's not the overwhelming factor at any rate. Um, Britain supports all, exports all sorts of things to the Gulf, um, not least services, financial services in terms of accountancy, um, banking, law, uh, charter surveying as well, um, and then high technology goods, um, and then just, you know, general exports. Um, and two of Britain's biggest firms, BP and Shell, the only two, Britain has about five of the world's top multinationals, and two of those are BP and Shell. Obviously, they have a major interest in Gulf oil. 
Now, UK arms sales to the regimes of the Middle East are an expression of these strategic priorities. Those arms sales help to keep the local regimes in power, and therefore they help to sustain that relationship and, and maintain those strategic and economic benefits to the British state and to British economic elites, to investors and corporations. Also, Gulf arms purchases help to sustain the UK's domestic arms industry, and that in turn helps to sustain the UK's overall military uh, capacity. So these are really complex, multifaceted uh, relationships of which arms sales are just one part, but one really, really, really important part. Now, the removal of these regimes by the peoples of the region would threaten this whole advantageous relationship from the, from the point of view of the British states. And naturally, British power has sided with friendly regimes against the peoples of the region, not just in 2011, but right through the 20th century, whenever there was a threat to the regimes from Arab nationalists, from anti-colonial forces, from the popular uprisings of 2010-11, the British have always sided with the, with, with the friendly regimes. One more thing I think is worth mentioning before I wrap up on you know, I've just got these 10 minutes. One more thing I just want to mention because I think it's really important in terms of the narrative around, around these relationships. And that's the role of racism in legitimising the policies that Britain has towards the Middle East. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Wearing. And when the panel discussion comes, I look forward to hearing you sort of elaborate on some of what you said there. Super, super interesting. Pleasure to have you with us. Now, um, if we could move on could we please move on to Mr. Awadai, um, if you're ready? Hi, hi. Thank you so much. Uh, it's not easy to start after uh, David's uh, excellent uh, remarks, but probably I would come from a speaking from another narrative, and that narrative coming from the fact that I have been uh, experiencing this uh, as a first-hand account when it comes into the status of fear uh, within the country. The status of fear in the country, living under a dictatorship for decades, is not an easy thing, is not an easy task to speak up against, against the regime. Or as a matter of fact, you cannot criticize any members of the ruling family because the consequences would be super harsh. There is no tolerance there. And they would make people as examples when they don't abide by those rules. So that's really uh, the status of fear in the Arab world is unimaginable to speak about to begin with. Sorry, just one second. Uh, so that status of fear has broken in 2010 and I think it was iconic just to remember what sparked all of this. It, it did spark in Tunisia, and Tunisia today, as you've seen the news, does not seem to be going forward. Like uh, uh, Albu Azizi, I still re recall this, Albu Azizi, a guy who sells vegetables. And into, when he encountered an issue with the police, he decided to burn himself. When he burned himself, that causes rage in Tunisia, and that causes rage about every single thing. All the problems were erased within that country, and that there was a unified voice in this country that that tabled the dictator uh, Zayd al Abidin bin Ali. That then we begin to see the chapter happening in Egypt, and those moments were moments of of joyment as well. You see the strength of the street, the Hrir Square, and the 18 days that led to the uh, collapse of Hosni Mubarak, uh, the dictator who ruled there for, for decades. Uh, that would give us really massive hope in Bahrain. In Bahrain was a different status. We, the neighbor of Saudi Arabia, we consider to be at the heart of what uh, David would would, will, will say that this is a vital location when it comes into oil, and, and this is a pretty much a strategic place for the US or for the, for the British government. Uh, and that was in itself, geopolitically, it was a massive challenge to be surrounded by those neighboring countries, either UAE or Saudi Arabia, 
And to find yourself is not only being abandoned uh, by your neighbors, but they being part of the problem, they being part of crashing you, sending their, uh, their armies, their troops to crush this movement. One thing was unique about Bahrain movement was the scale of the pro-democracy movement. It was a scale where, I don't know if it happened, I mean, I, I was looking into one of, Dr. Mark Onge was looking into this issue and would consider to have probably more than 30% of your entire population are on the streets, are demanding change, demanding democracy. This is an incredible, really incredible figure that within that scale was not seen in the entire Arab world. Uh, to have a, a, a figure which exceeded 100,000 in, in, in population which do not exceed 600,000, that in itself is really, really a massive figure uh, uh, to, to, to discuss. And that was a conservative figure. So we're talking about probably 200,000 were in the streets out of out of 600,000 population is a massive scale. It's literally the entire state from the youngest to the oldest were part of this massive movement. That movement for movement sounded to be unstoppable. Until we, and I, I recall those those really well. When the police began to crush this, this protest, we remember we were collecting the, uh, the tear gas canisters. And seeing the tear gas canister, most of them at that time made in UK or made in USA, it tells you so much that you are oppressed by a dictatorship. You're standing up against it as a nation, calling for democracy, only to find yourself as being crushed by the very same countries that they claim they are supportive of democracy or human rights or rule of law. They are the one which empower those regimes with every single means in order for them to, to maintain in that power. So, 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 so being on the receiving end of abuse and then later being subject to, to imprisonment, I do recall those moments so well. And even when I was handcuffed and as a political prisoner after being tortured, seeing the handcuff was made in the, the US is something I still remember. But in recent years, this also, not, this also escalated to Britain now begin to, uh, to sell uh, the, prison, uh, the prison equipment uh, uh, to the Bahraini regime. And you could see this story about the three years ago uh, in the Morning Star about a company based in Birmingham, uh, which was uh, selling the equipment. So this is a story that as a matter of fact, I received it from a prisoner in Bahrain telling me, do you know what? The new handcuff I received is from a company called TCH England. Could you be, would you be able to search this? And when begin, we begin to search all of this, we begin to see this company actually exists in, in, in the UK and it's in Birmingham. And uh, one investigative journalist, uh, Phil Miller, uh, ran a story about, about it when he contacted the company, explored uh, what the sort of things they would sell to the country. So it is a bit of complex story that we are seeing hope that the people will was tested. They come in the street, really united, everyone together. And when they were crushed, we've seen also like the hypocrisy of the West when it comes into being muted, being also supportive. And they're what they call it reforms of projects. Those reforms of uh, projects, which the British government now has spent uh, multi-millions when it comes into technical assistance uh, to the uh, to Bahrain in particular, we begin to see an outcome of it. A sharp increase in death penalty in the country. Sharp increase in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the targeting of uh, human rights defenders activists. A use of arbitrary revocation of citizenship. <laughs> Uh, uh, recently, I, I uh, you know, I am one of those which was, uh, which was, uh, which was born with, with uh, I'm a Bahraini national, so having a nationality is a birthright, only to find myself, even within this very basic right, is being taken away from me, simply because uh, I dare to be an activist in, in the UK. 
uh, and criticize the regime uh, from afar. This has led me to understand that the that that whatever the state would comment would commit in terms of humorous abuses, we would always be met with the same response that the British government will do whatever it takes to protect them, and even if they are committing violations to the international law. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, with the Pegasus project, the Israeli software that has been that has been used against uh, journalists, activists, and all of this, it was shocking to see my name to be listed uh, within those targeted lists after being contacted by the Guardian, telling me that you, you, you're one of those targets. Uh, it was shocking, not only that uh, to learn it was in not Bahrain as a state who was behind this operation. It was, as a matter of fact, uh, it was the Emirati government was a close ally to the Bahrainis who were behind the operation back into 2018. Uh, thankfully, that that my device was not uh, was not uh, hacked, uh, the current device. But I don't have any evidence about what happened before. I think with that uh, in mind, uh, my time is up, and I would love to hear your questions and listen to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Al Wadai. It's um, moving to hear of your personal experience with dictatorship in Bahrain and to hear about um, all that's happened since then. It was really fascinating. So thank you so much. Um, with that in mind, we are going to move on to a panel discussion. So um, I'm going to pose um, a series of questions to um, Mr. Al Wadai and Dr. Wearing before opening it up to you, um, on the to all of you in the audience or virtual audience, um, to hear your input and your questions. Um, please, could you type your questions in the chat, and we'll select ones which we feel are perhaps most appropriate. So yeah, just pop them in the chat. Um, it's not quite open to audience yet. Um, I'll let you know as of when. Thank you. So um, I wanted to start by asking a question for um, Mr. Al Wadai. Um, could I please ask you, and this is something I thought about a lot, was what policies could Britain and other nation, Western nations adopt, which would be most helpful to activists in Bahrain, just like you are, or or, or just like you are, fighting for democracy and human rights. Um, aside from stopping arms sales to Bahrain, what else would you want our government do to stand in solidarity with the activists of Bahrain? To be honest, this is a very hard question because uh, what I'm seeing is from the British government in terms of the support. And this is a simple example I always would give that in, 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 in politics, uh, and especially in a context where there is severe humorous abuses committed, there will be really two sides in this story. There will be one abuser side and there is a victim. And for nations or for governments, they have to pick up one. They could either support the pro-democracy movement and be backing the humorous movement in the country or be on the side of the uh, repression and back up those which are abusing this. Uh, so in this context, it's not, you know, it's not a, a rocket science to identify Britain to be fully backing the regime, fully backing uh, the ruling family. It's not just about the weapons which they have been providing, but it also through other means. Now the state is a pretty much run through British training. Like, this is similar thing to what is happening in Yemen, for instance. So it's not just the arms sale. This is one thing. But one thing which Britain being very much a specialist in is what I would call it whitewashing humorous abuses. So for the Saudis, for instance, would they commit a war crime in Yemen? They would, the British government would say, we will allow the Saudis, we will train the Saudis to investigate their alleged crime themselves. And that is unique project. Saudis never done this before and we are enabling them to do this. We know the answer to that. The answer is that Saudi Arabia would be better in lying about their crimes in Yemen. And, and, and that unit which, which they set up is nothing but just a whitewash 
unit that that its job just to whitewash their crimes. In Bahrain is a pretty much same thing, but it's uh, to do with the human rights context. So instead of uh, showing how the Bahrainis or how the ruling family would be able to, uh, so how they could how, how they could set up bodies and those bodies supposed to be mandated to investigate torture. But in reality, their job is to whitewash the human rights abuses. Between 2012 to this date, we at least know 6.5 million were spent by the taxpayers' money towards technical assistance programs to, to provide Bahrain or to help Bahrain to reform its judiciary or its, uh, its it, uh, the policing sector and all of that. The truth and the reality on the ground that the human rights situation is only deteriorating. And even when Bahrain go ahead and execute individuals, as a matter of fact, today is the third anniversary of the executions of three individuals on, 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 uh, on this very same, on this uh, same day that those individuals were, um, were executed and we had one of our colleagues who happened to, to, to take a direct action to escalate on the rooftop of the Bahraini embassy to call on jo Johnson to stop those unlawful executions. So sometimes, if you uh, to answer you shortly, it could be a telephone call to the rulers of Bahrain to say, stop this. There is, right now, there is a guy, uh, Dr. Abdeljali Senges, very respected uh, academic and uh, thanks to David and many other academics who are expressing their solidarity and support with him. As of today, he's entering his 19th day of hunger strike. He is mainly protesting degrading and humiliating the treatment uh, by the prison administration, but he also, like they have confiscated his research. A book he was writing, he spent literally four years in the prison writing and researching the book and it's been just confiscated. So all his ask is, we want this book to be returned to, to his family. The British government when been asked in parliament through different oral sessions at the Lords or through written questions, they would say, we're just monitoring the situation. So this is the side when it comes into, you monitor the situation, you see some guy is suffering, going through, taking the drastic action and, and this person should never spend a second in the prison. He was educated in the UK. He received his PhD from, from what is now is the Manchester University. So why these individuals will be totally abandoned? Why Britain would not stand up to what they call to human rights or to the rule of law or in this context into being supportive of a human rights defenders? So this is the sort of really simple tests that every time a Britain being asked about, or the British government being asked about, what's your view on this? You will see how they will really uh, be afraid and uh, would never criticize uh, the regime because they don't want to upset them. And they don't want to lose the priority market within the Gulf because Bahrain is just part of a bigger package that is called the Gulf, uh, the Gulf states, which I guess Saudi Arabia is a big partner in that. No, that's really interesting to hear. So even small things on an individual basis like that, it's interesting to hear how they could really make a difference to those protesters and activists' lives. It's um, a perspective I hadn't considered about how the government could tackle abuses in Bahrain. Um, Dr. Wearing, um, I had a question for you. Um, I was wondering um, if Britain like for a thought experiment, if Britain stopped selling arms to Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf monarchies tomorrow, say if Boris Johnson suffered from a concussion or something, what would, um, what would the short term and long term effect be in the region on issues like Yemen? Uh, first, let me just check, can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's all right, good. Yeah. I knew some problems with my sound before. Um, <clears throat> so, Let's think about it in terms of let's think about it in terms of Yemen as a good illustrative example because that's where the arms sales are doing the most damage at the moment. Now, when you when you argue that Britain should stop arming uh, Saudi because of the war in Yemen, one of the kinds of pushback that you get is people saying, "Well, if we don't arm them, then someone else will. If we don't sell them arms, then 
Russia will step in or China will step in. And it's one of those arguments that sounds really sort of clever and grown up and savvy and adult. And it sounds that way, but what it betrays is, is ignorance. Um, what we're selling them, what we have sold them, the Saudis, are weapon systems. We sell them an air force, right? We sell them the jets and the whole supporting infrastructure to go with it, ongoing maintenance, deep maintenance, components, which only we can provide because we made the jets, ammunition, which only we can provide that's compatible with those jets because we made the jets. Um, as I say, deep maintenance, which only we can provide because we made the jets. So to keep those jets in the sky, you need our ongoing support. Half the Saudi Air Force, or at least roughly half of the part of it that's operational over Yemen, are these British jets. According to one um, anonymous Saudi whistleblower who spoke to Channel 4 News Dispatches documentary, he said, the British jets, particularly the Typhoon, are so important to the Saudi war effort that if Britain withdrew the ongoing support that it's providing, that are keeping those jets in the sky, not only would half the Saudi Air Force be grounded, but effectively they couldn't carry on fighting the war because the British jets are so important to the overall war effort. I mean, their overall, overall war effort is it's 99% aerial bombing anyway. But the typhoons apparently are playing a major role. I don't know if that's, that, that's necessarily true. This is what the whistleblower says, and this is someone from formerly the Royal Saudi Air Force. But certainly those jets are usually important. Um, so there's a, a, a relationship of dependency develops when you provide these weapons. Um, which you can't just swap out overnight. So if Britain stops selling arms to Saudi Arabia in terms of the war in Yemen, in the immediate term, those planes don't fly. You haven't got half your air force is grounded. If you do it in conjunction with the US, you haven't got an air force. And their entire war is based on their air force. Now, over time, Russia and China perhaps could come in and sell arms to them. But it will take years you know, this war is happening now. You don't get to just press pause on a war and say, well, hang on, sorry, we haven't got jets anymore. We'll be, we'll be back in a few years when we've had our orders come in. You know, that's not how it works. And that also presupposes, because remember, the arms sales aren't just, it's not just a customer-vendor relationship. It's, it's a strategic relationship. We're selling them arms, the Americans are selling them arms because there's a deeper and wider strategic bond between the two sides, right? Now, if Russia and China decide that they want to sell those arms, it's also, that's going to come as part of a bigger commitment to the security of the regime. Now, does Russia or China have the capacity to guarantee the survival of the House of Saud in the same way as the Americans have done and in the same way as the British did before them? No, they don't, fundamentally. The, the, the disparity in power and capacity between the US on the one hand and China and Russia on the other is still huge, absolutely massive. So in terms of that particular question, no. um, you know, and it's, it's really worth making sure people understand that so that you guys, you know, um, people, who, people who've come here in the audience, when you go out and have your arguments with your friends and neighbours or in your activism, you know, when people say that to you, you make sure that you've got that answer. You know, that it's important that I give you that answer to make sure that you've got that to hand and you can say that to people in your, in your conversations. Um, in terms of the more day-to-day -day stuff, in terms of repression, um, again, it's all part of that deeper relationship. Now, you know, smaller, small arms, more of it comes from the US. I mean, the US is the big protector, right? Britain's got a secondary role. So it doesn't always hinge on Britain. In Saudi is a special case because Britain's provided so much arms in, in terms of that war in Yemen. Small arms, okay, perhaps I can do without us. But it's still really important. If Britain, one of the five permanent members of the Security Council, one of the top six, seven richest countries in the world, still a major state by any stretch of the imagination, if Britain says, we no longer arm Bahrain, we no longer arm Saudi because of what they, that's a major, major political blow to those regimes, which depend on 
um, a degree of legitimacy that they're granted by the support they get from the West. You know, you, it may seem insignificant to some people here. They won't see it as insignificant. They care so much about their, their international reputation, their international prestige, to the relationships they have with the UK and the US. So make no mistake, as it wouldn't just be symbolic. It would be a major political and diplomatic blow for them if those arms sales were withdrawn. So it's not a small thing. I think it's fantastic that you kind of combated one of those main counter arguments given by those who support arms sales. And it's sort of important that, you know, we think in such detail and so critically about those things. So that answer touched on some really fascinating and powerful points and that, you know, the China and Russia simply cannot replicate the support that US and Britain give. That especially was really interesting to hear. Um, I'm going to give one more question to each of you before I open things up to the floor. So um, my final question to um, Mr. al and Ernard, um, is what would it take, do you think, for there to be a successful Arab Spring in Bahrain, um, one in which its people finally have democracy and freedom? Can you envisage this happening in the next 20 years, or even in yours or mine lifetime? Uh, that's uh, another hard question, but uh, as someone who is always optimistic about uh, change, uh, in my view, change uh, would happen with, with, you have to look into what the other side can offer and what you can offer on the same side. Would we'll give just one simple example about the case of, uh, for instance, uh, a Dr. Abdeljali Sengis, the guy which is on hunger strike. And by the way, I would encourage anyone who would spare a minute to write a letter to their uh, MP. Uh, it wouldn't take, I just shared the link on the chat link. Uh, so see what we have here. The, the state is holding this man as a hostage for 10 years. He, is, he was subjected to the most aggressive and most brutal form of torture that anyone would imagine. He, is, he, he was a disabled person by birth, but I remember he was providing his own testimony, you know, to kill someone because of his disability, to just to curse them, to say, like to, 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 to insult them because they are disabled and to use that disability against them as part of, their, as part of, of the threats against them to a threat that you would rape his daughters uh, and you will cause serious harm to his family, to force him to crutch, uh, to, to crawl on the ground, uh, to go to the toilet when he needs it because he has no, his crutches were taken away from him. This sort of things happened in 2010 and uh, 2011. And 10 years later, maybe people would not really hear too much about this thing as we used to about the horrific torture happening in the country. But what is happening, this person is still suffering 10 years behind bars, 10 years of unlawful imprisonment, 10 years of denying most of his basic rights. Who is, then the, the second question, who is the, on the winning side? Uh, today, we've seen this guy is to be uh, an icon for democracy as a true leader to show that you cannot break these individuals, despite what the regime has done to Dr. Senge so through 10 years of arbitrary imprisonment, he still can stand up. He is on hunger strike for 19 days because he refuses to be humiliated by prison guards or to, to allow them to take away his, 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 his box or his, his research. This resilience, this, this is strength of believing that every day that you cannot crush me, that I'm winning, is really what is giving us hope. So it's through those which are standing up in the most difficult, imagine, like the most difficult status that you would imagine, you will see the power of the strength they have. Those are the individuals that cannot be broken and therefore the solidarity movement comes together. I think last week we've seen uh, some MPs uh, providing their support publicly this week, organizations like Amnesty International, 
Human Rights Watch and many international organizations will issue a statement uh, expressing their solidarity and support, renewing calls for his release. Uh, so as long as you have a valid legitimate case, you will be always on the winning side as long as you didn't you don't betray your own values as long as you still committed to it then the victory will be a matter of time and i i think we've seen how for instance how the saudis uh, maybe who would imagine like the american one day will decide to stop the arms uh, to, to to the saudi under the biden administration this is a really significant and strategic thing so so the shifts in power will come eventually and all we need to do is we need to ensure that we have a duty to shed light on abuses ensure that uh, we push for accountability and support those calls although even at a time when it doesn't look too optimistic you just have to to maintain uh, that support and sometimes who knows uh, you could at least win a lot of things I wanted to end with this. I think there is one there is one important part of this struggle is our ability to keep this story, this story of a struggle, is uh, maintaining in the media and how much we can uh, counter the the PR uh, narrative from the government. This year, I think uh, I could show one one really nice example of uh, Bahrain is very much well known for Formula One race in the country. And uh, this year, what really sparked the media significantly is a, a child who is 11 years old, who drew a picture of Lewis Hamilton, the F1 champion car, uh, the Mercedes. He drew his, his painting and he asked Lewis Hamilton, please save Lewis, please save my father, who his father is, is on death row. That, that, that drawing really moved the, the uh, world champion and he spoke about the human rights in the country during the Formula One race uh, this year in the country. And instead of having it dominated by PR uh, from the government side, it was uh, pretty much dominated by, uh, by, the, uh, by stories of individuals who are suffering the most shedding most light on them. And I think that, uh, that some comments from Lewis Hamilton and support of those was, was quite significant as well. So it's a long shot. And I don't know if it is in 10 years or in, in whatever time we can uh, achieve this. But I think maintaining uh, our best, our strength, and just believing in our value is really important. And I have to say, like, it's incredible to have even events like this, just to discuss this, how people can help, how people can come together showing solidarity is vitally important. So the last question I wanted to ask before we opened up to the panel, and by the way, um, thank you, Mr. Alwada, for answering my questions. I mean, especially hearing about the torture that people you know have had to undergo is horrifying and sobering to hear, but I think ultimately necessary that people know what's happening. So thank you for that. Um, the last question I wanted to ask to Dr. Weering was, and it's kind of a two-in-one question, so I'm cheating slightly, but it's, does Saudi Arabia exert more influence on Britain than Britain exerts influence on Saudi Arabia? And kind of in that, if we broke this kind of cycle of codependency we have with these regimes and actually um, actively promoted democracy instead of just a PR campaign which doesn't reflect the reality of what we're doing, if we actually genuinely stood up and tried to promote democracy in the region, along with other Western states, do you think that the Middle East and these Arab states would have a thriving democratic culture and state within the next 10 years or so, if that was to happen, if there was a major ideological sea change in the way foreign policy is thought about? So it's a kind of a two in one question. So. Okay. Okay, I'll do the second one first. We don't need to do anything to promote democracy in the Middle East because the peoples of the Middle East, apart from their regimes at the top, are committed to it. That's what they want. They risk their lives, you know, in, in all the ways that I described, you know. Um, I remember thinking in 2011, 
as all this was happening. These people are so brave. They know what's going to happen next. And they're out there anyway. Um, and that pressure from below for democracy has been there for decades, you know, for those of Arab nationalism right up to now. We don't need to do anything to promote democracy. All we need to do is remove the obstacles that we're placing in the way. That's we, as in Britain, the United States, France, and in, in other cases, we're talking about Russia. You remove those obstacles, i.e. the support for the regimes on which those regimes depend, and those regimes will be no match for their people. And change will happen in that part of the world, just as it's happened everywhere else, where democracy has taken hold. As soon as external support for anti-democratic regimes is removed, those regimes tend to fall away. We saw it in Latin America, we saw it in Southern Africa, we saw it in Eastern Europe, and we would see it in the Middle East as well when external support is removed. So we don't need to do anything to promote democracy in the Middle East, we just need to stop blocking democracy in the Middle East. Um, in terms of the balance of power, I've seen it expressed many times in the media that, you know, we're at the mercy of the Saudis because they're the ones with all the money and stuff like this. I've seen, um, was it that fucking, what's his name, Simon Tisdall, do you know the, the guy who writes the foreign policy analysis in The Guardian? Just this clown, using the word obsequious. The British government have been obsequious to the Saudis. Like, Britain <laughs> is one of the few nuclear armed states in the world. Britain is one of the five permanent members of the Security Council. Britain is the sixth largest economy in the world. Britain is one of the two or three largest economies in Europe. Britain has the world's leading financial centre. Britain is a member of NATO. The idea that Britain, one of the five, six most powerful countries in the world, gets bossed around <clears throat> by Saudi Arabia. It's ridiculous, it's laughable. And what it is that, because you hear it time and again in the, in the dominant discourse, is the, the inability or the refusal of the British elite to accept that British power might be anything other than inherently good. So when Britain does something bad, it must be because someone else is making us do it because we're inherently good. We're, it, we're the Democrats, we're the good guys, we're the ones with the Western values. And that's true because it's true because it's true. You don't need any evidence. It's true no matter what the facts are. So when Britain's supporting anti-democratic regimes and literally providing them with the arms to crush people supporting democracy, but promoting, uh, protesting for democracy, it must be because those awful regimes are making us do it. You know, and it's that, that constant sense of Western innocence. You see it time and time and again. I think the discourse around our relationship with the, these states is really interesting and really worth analysing. For those kind of inflections, that constant sense of our innocence, of our goodness, and, and their, you know, their nefariousness, you know, their backwardness, their um, whatever. And it, it all goes back to this kind of racialized view that we have. So, you know, Britain, together with the other external powers, has huge leverage. You just look at the material balance of forces and it's perfectly obvious, you know. So go to that and you can sweep away some of this kind of, you know, sort of dominant discourse that we have, which, which obfuscates a lot. No, that's interesting. And it links back to what you said about essentialism in your talk and kind of that fundamental ideology which blinds us sort of in the way we speak about it. Um, just as a really quick follow-up question, just before we move to the floor is, do you think then that as a consequence of Britain's support for these regimes, that when democracy does come, Britain's now paralysed and other Western nations are paralysed as a fear that these democratic nations would perhaps be um, hostile to Britain because of the way that it has treated, it has um, supported the regimes which have repressed them for so long. Do you think that fear plays a role in Britain's immoral justification of their support for the regimes? I mean, that was definitely true in the 50s and 60s, definitely, with people like Nasser. Um, just the, the, the fear that Arab nationalists would be, you know, well, the, the recognition that they were explicitly anti-Western. 
and that they would switch go, either go to the other side in the Cold War or just be neutral, you know, not be specifically aligned to the West. Whereas now, I don't think it's so obvious that those countries, I mean, Arab nationalism doesn't have the same kind of purchase that it did in those days. But it's a gamble, I think, from the West point of view. What, what if these countries were run by their own people? They might make all, all sorts of terrible decisions. You know, we can't have that. You know, the, 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 the function of these countries is not to be run by their own people, it's to be run in our interests. So it's more, I think it's more an anxiety about those countries having autonomy under democratic governance. Um, but the justification from that anxiety from the point of view of British power is perhaps not as strong as it was 50, 60 years ago when you had really oppositional Arab nationalism to the fore in those countries. Um, those countries would still want good, correct relationships with you know, countries around the world. But I, I dare say if they were run by their people, they'd behave a bit differently. That's fascinating to hear and to really have such sort of detail and sort of eloquence from both you and Mr. al And um, yeah, it's been great. Now let's open it to you, all of you who've been listening. Um, let's get your input for the last 20 minutes or so. I'm fascinated to hear your questions. Just bear, bear with us a sec, just because they might be just coming through. So you might have to wait 30 or 40 seconds. Um, Nick, I've dropped the questions, the first three questions into the chat. Yes, um, I'll read out the one from Katerina. Is that the one that you dropped through? There, was, there were three. There was one for the first three were from Paul, from Sam and from uh, Katrina. Mm, OK. Um, this is an interesting one, especially because it relates to activism. Um, from Katerina. Thank you to the panel, so informative and the video is great. Given the current Conservative government, which if we're pessimistic aren't going anywhere for a while, we might assume our governments are unlikely to act. So two questions really. What are the best things that we as individuals can do to change this? And how do we get people engaged on this issue? I suppose this is kind of like inherently maybe more directed towards uh, Mr. Alwadai, but I'd be interested to hear both your perspectives on this as I'm sure Katrina would. Yeah, thank you so much Katrina for the ex excellent question and I'm sharing my screen to show you what it means sometimes to have a conservative government and the lack of consequences. So that's Philip Hammond just last month being offered, being announced and being, being cleared up to take uh, two jobs for two governments. One of them is without big guess is the Saudi government and the second government is the Bahraini government. Both of them, uh, I was reading what the foreign office would have to offer about this. They will say that Philip Hammond would be free to, uh, to work uh, for the government of Bahrain without seeing any sort of potential risk by any means. Like, like the foreign office would not view Bahrain as to be a problem to them. It's just because simply uh, they consider it to be a strong ally state and they would not see any problem with this. You know, when stories like this emerge, it does really tell you quite a lot about this guy was the second top minister in the government. It's not just like a minister. Uh, he held the most powerful positions, like, you know, defense secretary or the foreign secretary or the chancellor of the country. This is, these are like, there is one more important job that he didn't told is being the prime minister. So with all of this is just to have him to work for the Saudis just tells you so much about what was his role before when he was uh, a chancellor? Why would he visit those countries? And those answers are really important to raise the issue of conflict of interest and why we are not outraged about these relations. Maybe Philip Hammond is no longer in this position, is no longer representing the government. But there is what I would call it a, a pattern of identifying British officials, diplomats, will end up working uh, for foreign states. And in, in the case of Bahrain, we've seen also like um, former ambassadors will come and work for the government. 
it just tells you so much about like um, about why this is not a subject to outrage and the issue of what I would call it conflict of interest is really important. So I believe that the supporting the work, investigative work, conducting really important research, the sort of research CAT is offering when it comes into looking into the license. The figures, maybe when you look into it for one year, it doesn't look really so much shocking. But when you look at over a decade of over 10 years, and then you begin to see figures in millions or in billions, are they begin to shake? Uh, to, to, it's also about our role, how much we can keep our agenda important when it comes into the media. I wanted just to show another story, uh, which also like reflect outrage. That's a pretty detail. About a few months ago, she met with the Minister of Interior. This man was in his post when the Arab Spring, when the people were crushed, and to this date, he remains in his position. Uh, he's the one which is responsible for the murder of a number of individuals, torture, systematic policy of systematic torture in the country, and all of that. So just to have him coming to Britain and being receiving the red carpet treatment and to have this smiley PR photo with, with the Priti Patel really tells you everything you need to know about why it's important just for us to stay together in solidarity and calling out those abuses. And our action, I think, is that to have that, that, that this exposure to be like, to have it at least exposed when it comes into the media is extremely important. To have solidarity uh, within activists that they would condemn such actions is important because individuals like Dr. Abjelis Senges, who's on hunger strike, when he hear there are X number of academics who are supporting him. He's not gonna care about the British government because this will be the least of his interests. He knows they are not an ally for his struggle, but he count of individuals of our movement that we could show him the support, that we could echo his voice, that we could make it so much difficult for Bahrain or for Hamon or for any officials who would come to this country that to feel that there is what I would call it a, a resistance, a protest, that your presence is not welcome. If we manage to send this message every time, although it may not change the nature of the relationship, but it is pity. It is making it so much difficult for them. And it, trust me, they hate headlines like this. They don't like them and they don't like see, they, they, they would prefer to see themselves just being welcomed in a different way. So, so any solidarity is, is, is extraordinarily important and it sends the right message to the individuals. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for that question, Katrina, and um, your response. It's important. Um, it's important that we really know what we can do as individuals. So thank you. I'll can I have a stab at answering that as well? Yeah, uh, of course, um, my apologies. <laughs> that's all right, that's all right. Um, yeah, it's a really important question, Katrina. Can I give you a concrete example of where pressure has worked and where pressure has saved lives in recent years? Um, in, in, in Yemen in 2018, Yemen's an import-dependent country. You've heard about Yemen being the site of the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe. This catastrophe, the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe, is man-made. It's man-made because Yemen is an import-dependent country under blockade from the Saudi-led coalition. And the Houthis is playing a role in creating a catastrophe as well by siege tactics on, on, on civilian areas. But the, the, the Saudi-led coalition's blockade on the country is one of the largest causes of the, of, the, of, the, of the humanitarian catastrophe. In 2018, Saudi UAE-led forces were bearing down on, on the port, the major port that the people of Yemen are dependent on. It's an import-dependent country. So if you blockade it, you know what's going to happen. It was already the poorest country in the region. If you blockade it, you know what's going to happen. And, that's, and, and, and they did. And people have been you know, dying in, in incredible numbers. 85,000 infant children died of starvation or preventable disease in the first few years of the war. 85,000 infant children, children under the age of five, a number you could fill, fill Wembley Stadium with. So it's, it's, it's really horrific. In 2018, the war was getting, the fighting was getting closer to this port, Hodeida, on which the entire country depends. 
the UN was saying to the warring parties and to the Western governments that were supporting the warring parties, you must stop, you must not fight over Hodeida. If you do, and Hodeida get, is, is, is severed from the rest of the country, the imports can't get through, this is going to become the worst famine in 100 years. And think of the precedents, you know, the famines in China, under Mao, Ethiopia, Bangladesh. It's, it's really saying something. And the, the British and the Americans just ignored this. Trump's government ignored it. I think it was Theresa May, wasn't it, at the time? She ignored it. And, and the fighting was getting close. This was going on for months. The UN were trying to raise the alarm, and the British and the Americans were just ignoring them. Fighting was getting closer to the port. And then Jamal Khashoggi is killed in October 2018. And suddenly, it becomes a big story. Not just the killing of Khashoggi, but it triggers a whole conversation about the relationship between the West and the Saudis. And suddenly we're talking about everything. I go on TV a few times now and again, or on radio a few times now and again, interviewed as an expert. I was on TV four times a day, or TV, radio, or something like that, three, four times a day for a fortnight plus. I was doing so much media, never done so much before or since. It was on the front page all the time. And as a result of all this pressure, the British and the Americans felt forced to pull the plug on what the Saudis were doing, or at least to, you know, to, to restrain the Saudis. So the British and the Americans suddenly put all this pressure on the Saudis. The Saudis were forced to negotiate a ceasefire, a partial ceasefire around Hodeida. Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, didn't want to sign this partial ceasefire. The American Defense Secretary at the time effectively instructed him to sign it when he was reticent. That's all down to political pressure in the West. There was a partial ceasefire and people live, people who are alive now who would otherwise be dead, because, and I'm talking not just one or two, because of that explosion of political pressure in the West. You know, that, 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 that spotlight of scrutiny that was suddenly being shone on what, on what the West were doing with the Saudis in Yemen. So that power that activists have, that people in the West have, the media have, the politicians have, that we have, has always been there. And it just gives you a glimpse of what happens when that power gets used. Um, so we don't have to wait for the Conservative government to, you know, to, to, to leave office. They were in office in 2018 when they forced the Saudis to back down over Hodeida. You've got to apply the pressure, you know, because as you, as you say, Katrina, they're, they're going to be in government for at least the next two or three years. It doesn't look like they're going to lose to Keir Starmer either, does it? So they could be in government for at least 10 years, and the Middle East can't wait that long. So we've got to be the ones applying the pressure. And no one needs me to explain what to do to apply pressure on governments, because there's a repertoire for that. Letter writing, um, marches, um, you, know, or, or, you know the activist repertoire, and you can go on the CAT website and look, click on, I think it's the Get Involved link, and they'll tell you what to do. So we all know what to do. But the, being committed to applying that pressure and really doing it in whatever way works for you as an individual, we know that works. It's, it's been shown. And we can do that on Bahrain as well as on Saudi and on many other things. And by the way, part of that pressure has to be, so this is a long answer, just one more point. Part of the, the pressure has to be, because we now have a different, very different faction running the Labour Party, there's no point waiting for the Conservatives to go because Labour will do the same as the Conservatives have been doing if they win. If Starmer somehow you know, transforms into Barack Obama in the next couple of years and wins an election. I don't know how that's going to happen. If, if he wins an election, you know, he might pull some of the aid for the Saudi war over Yemen, but fundamentally the arms sales to places like Bahrain will continue. The relationship will continue. It's the same under Labour Conservative and it has been for decades. So if you're still a member of the Labour Party, that party is a site of contest. And fighting within that party of a certain policies remains really, really important. Not letting them back, backtrack on policies that Corbyn brought in in terms of arms sales is really important. So, you know, making sure that someday there'll be an alternative government that will pursue a different set of, set of policies, that's something else that's worth doing as well. 
that's really interesting to hear, especially the specific example you gave over Hudida, which illustrates um, just how much shining spotlight on things can make a difference. I'm conscious of time, so we'll have one or two more questions. Um, one is from Paul Thomas, and I think this is a very timely question. He asked, what do you think the implications of the current situation in Tunisia is? And if there could be a very super brief explanation for those who haven't been up to date with what's been happening in Tunisia with regard to the president sacking the prime minister. So what are the implications of the current situation in Tunisia? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Um, I mean, Tunisia is not really my area um, because Tunisia has always been part of um, uh, France Afrique, as it's called. You know, it's been Tunisia, Algeria. These were the countries under French control, and and, and Britain hasn't had much influence in in North Africa. Um, as a general point, though, which is that part of the reason for the Arab uprisings, at least in North Africa and the Levant, were the neoliberal economic model that the Europeans and the IMF imposed on these countries through those regimes, whereby the, the economies of those countries were turned into sort of um, this sort of low wage basic export model, <clears throat> producing things like textiles, for example, um, you know, budget restraint, uh, lowering wages, uh, weakening unions, uh, you know, fiscal restraint, austerity, stuff like that imposed by the IMF or, you know, encouraged by the Europeans. Now, Tunis in countries like Tunisia, but in others too, let, let, let's, let, let's, let's talk about Tunisia. Tunisia's on this tentative path out of dictatorship and trying to establish its democracy. People need the political space to make that work and the economic situation in Tunisia isn't helping them. And something that the Global North countries can do, or something we can demand that Global North countries do, is to give them the policy space, you know, let them it, cancel their debts, cancel state, uh, cancel sovereign debt, for example. Um, don't impose on austerity on them, you know. It, help them to develop higher wage economies so people can have a decent standard of living. If they're constantly firefighting, the economic situation, and the economic situation has been imposed in part by the West for the IMF, then it's going to be that much harder for democracy to flourish. You know, one of the reasons that democracy is in trouble at the moment in Tunisia is because people are so angry about the state of the economy 10 years after the Arab uprisings. Um, so, you know, Britain plays a major role in the IMF. It's one of the major shareholders in the IMF. If, if, for example, a Corbyn led Labour Party had won the last election, they could have used their position in the IMF to end neoliberal structural adjustment and have the IMF play a better role. So that's one thing we can do. But as I say, not really my area. Um, Mr. Alwadai, did you have anything to say briefly on that before we move on to the final question? Yeah, it's the serious stuff happening there that people begin to feel that there is a serious scope is, 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 is just taking place, you know, the, freezing the authority of parliament, stripping the immunity of its members, uh, stopping the authority of the prime minister. This is that there is a serious uh, risk that uh, Tunisia, the only, the only country which at least benefit the most from the Arab Spring Revolution is now is on a, an extremely and extraordinarily difficult position that if this allowed and maintained, this could be a return of a military operation and that we will see another version of Egypt. So it's an extremely uh, worrying uh, place to look into, but also is again, the solidarity and how important it is to support the people even through those messages, through solidarity would be vitally important. Oh, well, thank you for that answer. And um, yeah, I encourage everyone to keep up to date with the um, situation in Tunisia. Um, the BBC did an article on it today and a video explaining what's going on. So I checked that out. For our final question, um, it's from Omar. Um, and as I said, again, direct to both of you. It's given that Western governments 
only support the people when backing the dictator. No, sorry. Um, given that Western governments only support the people when backing the dictator is no longer in their interest, e.g. in Syria and Libya, how do you think the principle of protecting human rights and democracy can be aligned with British or in general Western strategic interests, i.e. economic, military, etc.? Shall I have a go at that one? Yeah. Um, well, they have, a, they have a range of strategic interests, um, Western states. Maximising the state's power in the international system, um, making the world safe for British capital, British investors and British exporters, and maintaining their own place in government. Now, what activism is all about is changing the calculation for them. So long as there's no domestic pressure, they will continue to do what they do. You raise the political cost of them doing what they do and they may have to back down. That's what happened after the Khashoggi killing. And as I just said in response to Virginia's point, it shouldn't take something like that for us, us to raise the cost. You know, I'm somewhat frustrated as someone who's been involved in this sort of thing for 20 years now, that we, we could get a million people onto the streets for the invasion of Iraq, but I haven't seen anything like that for Yemen. And yet the consequences of Britain's role in Yemen are every bit as bad as the consequences of our role in Iraq. It's just that someone else was doing the actual fighting. And it comes to the same thing, you know, the destruction of a country. Um, we can, when we put our minds to it, get out there and put pressure on government. You know, what happened with just after the Khashoggi death shouldn't have taken the Khashoggi death. We could have done that as civil society all along. So, you know, us in this room, in this virtual room, we're all engaged. It's about us now using our engagement to get, out, to get other people engaged as well and to get ourselves to that kind of critical mass where we can be out there either on the streets or bringing pressure in whatever other way to force the governments to change their calculation. On the one hand, they want to make, they, they want to support the Saudi regime, the regime in Bahrain. On the other hand, they feel it's going to cost them politically, and that forces them to change that, that change of calculation. Forces them to change their behaviour. Um, you know, short of some kind of revolution against British capitalism and, and British imperialism, which isn't happening anytime soon. There, there's always going to be an, a, 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 an impulse for the British state to behave in this way. So it's always going to be about people power through the ballot box, through activism, to shift that balance of power. You know, we can do it, but, you know, it'll take some effort. Um, Mr. Awadai, did you um, want to say anything on that matter? Yeah, I wouldn't really honestly add much of, uh, uh, of what David has offered. Uh, but I have seen those moments of enjoyment when serious actions are taken. Take, for example, uh, CAT when they took the British government to court. And I was uh, uh, in court that day to hear the announcement that, that, the, that the Saudis arms uh, where like, the British arms to, to Saudi were unlawful. Although it, this does not really last it forever. But this is, again, is a persistent question about the standing on the right cause is extremely important. I was, I was in, I would say, attending both trials, the initial judgment. And, uh, if I recall it correctly, it was in 2018. And the judge just simply did not see a problem with the British selling arms to the Saudi despite what is happening. But the moral question, even if, even if, even uh, e the moral question, British government selling arms is wrong and we should do whatever we can to oppose it. The judicial means is one of them and not give up on it as well. So, so, so the appeal process as assuring that we have the, the best lawyers to present to make a persuasive case to win this was vitally important. And that in itself will come with the political support. Then you would have the Labour Party being more of a 
supportive into this issue, just even issue that they did not speak for, for a long time, they will be, it will be dominating, the press will be dominating all of that. So sometimes there is a role to play in this. And that role is always to be, what did we do to add value to this cause, to help it, to resolve it, to add significant pressure on those governments. And uh, yeah, so there is a quite a lot and there are bright examples for us really to look into as excellent uh, examples to move forward with. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I think that's um, all we have time for. It's been fascinating and, and um, I could envisage this panel, panel probably going on for hours and hours on end. Um, just wanted to say on Dr. Wearing's point about protest, um, and that there's been nothing and um, we will be protesting outside the Excel Centre um, in September, I believe, Ian. Um, um, yeah, that's right. September 14th is, is the day of action against the DSEI Arms Fair. Um, but there might be well, we other weeks of action, but yeah, keep an eye out for that on the yeah. website. And um, yeah, effectively a conference where um, Saudi officials, Bahraini officials go to to lay the groundwork for arms dealings we'll be protesting there so um yeah so join us hopefully you'll be able hopefully all, any of you in the audience would love to have you joining us so just before um i leave i just wanted to again reiterate my thanks to dr wearing and mr alwadai for their powerful words and piercing insights um like it's amazing to have two such distinguished guests with us here who's so knowledgeable you know, I'm used to sort of seeing interviews by you done online and listening to them. So to actually be able to be involved in that, it's been amazing. Um, thank you to all those who logged on tonight for this event. But also I want to give thanks to some of my friends in CAT who helped me um, and played a huge role producing, helping me develop this video. I want to thank um, Ian Pocock, Kirsten Bays and Sienna Bangura who played a huge role for promoting the event, as well as organizing the guest speakers. Um, I want to thank Ian Pritchard, who fact-checked the script for this video, ensuring everything was completely accurate. Um, though most importantly, I want to thank Hanan Majid and the rest of the team at the filmmaking company, Rainbow Collective. Um, they produced and edited the video and did the um, audio, and it was an absolute pleasure to work with them. Um, as a final word, um, we at CAT stand in solidarity with all those still struggling for freedom in these nations 10 years after the Arab Spring. We stand with them, even though we cannot truly understand what they've risked and lost. I hope many of you join us for future events, speaking out against the role our governments play in fueling the regimes repressing people around the world is something we'll continue to do at CAT. For now, though, Good night and we'll have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.